Great to see you here at the EU's public meeting. If I haven't met you before, my name is Rowan Kemp. I lead the staff team that work alongside the EU. Glad you could join us here today. Uh, just let me sort of encourage you too, because uh, we've got Meet Jesus events starting tonight with the Mark drama and then next week. And just in case you sort of didn't quite clock it as we went through those announcements with Jemima, next week, if you turn up here, no one will be here because we're not meeting here on Wednesday. We're meeting instead. Where was it? Did anyone notice? In the new law annex. So somewhere over that way. Check the website, right, so that you turn up to the right place. And because if you're bringing friends along, which I'd encourage you to do, because next Wednesday we get to hear from Polly Butterworth, um, you want to know where you're going. Also, different talk every day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, for the next two weeks. Great opportunity to come as many times as you can, but do check the website so you get the locations so that you turn up to the right spot. Uh, and also we'll be having prayer meetings in the morning on each of those days. If you can join us for prayer, that'd be great to sort of commit this moment to reach out with the gospel of Jesus to the campus. Great if you can commit, uh, come and join us in prayer. And Monday morning, dawn prayer meeting at the revised time of seven, seven not six. We were saying six o'clock. Whoever decided to get together to pray at six o'clock in the morning, crazy person. It was me. I thought six o'clock was a great idea. I timed it. With, I just thought that would be... And then reason prevailed and we've moved it to 7, which is way better for everybody. So Victoria Park, Monday morning, 7 a.m., dawn prayer meeting. And then we get to hear Glenn Scrivener Monday afternoon, 3 to 5. Uh, Glenn is one of the foremost, um, I think, Australian evangelists in the world at the moment. Like in terms of just, he's just written some fantastic stuff. He's written this book called The Air We Breathe. If you haven't read that, it's worth, worth a read. Uh, and we've got him coming, we said, tell us, about, tell us about what you know about presenting the gospel in our culture. And so we've got him for two hours next Monday afternoon, three to five. Check the website. I think that it's well worth making the effort to come to and then bring your friends to hear him over the next couple of weeks. Okay, so I hope you can join us for those things. Uh, Martin Luther, who if you're at annual conference, I talked a little bit about him on Friday morning, so you're probably sort of struggling to stay awake by the time we got to Friday morning of annual conference. But Martin Luther, famous reformer, church reformer, was born in the uh, late, 15, late 1400s, lived into the 1500s. And uh, one of the, he was German. One of the things that he did was he translated the Bible into the German language using German vernacular so that the God's word would be accessible to people. So he translated the whole of the Bible. I mean, that in itself would be a remarkable thing to do. But when he translated the Bible and it got it published, he added some comments in the margins at various points in the Bible, just to help the reader. And this was one of the comments he made next to one particular verse in the Bible. And he said, this, this verse is, the chief point and the very central place of the epistle and of the whole Bible. What verse might he have written that against? Have a chat to the person next to you. Take a guess. Just pick, pick a verse that you think would maybe fit such a description. What verse could it have been from the Bible that he wrote that against? All right, let's have some suggestions. I have no idea how many, I have no idea how many verses are in all of the Bible. Someone who's can look that up on Google. I'm sure Siri will tell you. My, I, my recollection is there's just over a thousand chapters in the Bible, so you've got a lot of verses to pick from. Um, just take a random guess. What verse might he have written it against? If you were just going to pick a verse, call it out. John 3.16, I think you would think would be sort of an obvious one. What, what, 
What argues against John 3.16 being the particular verse that he wrote it against in this instance? Yeah? He mentions the word epistle, which means letter. So therefore, it's going to be, he must have written against one of the New Testament letters, not John 3.16. But controversial that he didn't write it against John 3.16, in my view. Yeah, okay. What, give me another verse he could have written it against. Take a guess. Sorry? Something from Romans? Yeah, good guess, since we're doing Romans. Yeah, it's not too hard. Yep, go on. Anything else? Yep. You could do a version of Ephesians 2. There's some beautiful truths in Ephesians 2. It turns out it is from the book of Romans, and it is from the passage we had read today. And so take a guess from today's passage. What verse do you reckon it would be? 23. 23? Correct. Well done. He wrote it against Romans 3.23. And the next sort of, sort of sentence that that goes on, which it go, reads like this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Why would he have written it against this particular sentence, this particular verse? I think because it, it really does cover this sort of sentence of Paul, covers the entirety of what we'd call salvation history, the whole story of salvation. In a way, it summarises the whole story that's recorded for us in the scriptures. Not everything that's in the Bible, but it does have a lot. In fact, you could say that it has our predicament there in the first, in verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's our human predicament. It has God's solution and are justified by his grace as a gift to be received by faith. That's his solution, God's solution. And then he has Jesus at the center through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. It has the problem or our predicament, it has God's solution and has Jesus at the centre. That's quite, quite useful. But to sort of get that in your mind, it will be better if those sort of three bits, you know, God, our predicament, God's solution, Jesus at the centre, it would be better if they all started with the same letter. Don't you think? If you could sort of think of three words that sort of captured that. So work with the person next to you. What are the three? I'll give you an example, right? Our tragedy, God's terrific response and Jesus' tremendous sacrifice. That would be a way, but I'm sure you can do better than that, right? You're trying to capture the three things that are here, our predicament, God's solution, and Jesus at the centre. I'm sure you can come up with something better than mine, so go for it. Chat to the person next to you. What, how would you sort of summarise that? Use your university vocabulary. Any suggestions? I'm sure we've got some English students here who have just been waiting for this moment just to sort of let loose their extreme extension to vocabulary from school. Any suggestions? I'll take anything, no matter how lame. I mean, mine was pretty lame. Up the back, yeah, I saw you guys high-fiving each other, so I'm expecting something good here. Because of sin, we need salvation that is determined through his sacrifice. Not bad. Our sin. God's salvation earned through Jesus' sacrifice. Nice, thank you. Yep, great. Any other suggestions? Yeah. yeah. Um, problem is sin. Yeah. Uh, propitiation is the answer. Yeah. Yeah. And then we just like the promise is like grace or redemption. 
Okay, yep, yeah, problem, promise, and propitiation. Yep, great, yeah, good. One more. Yep. Faithless. Not bad, yep, yep, faithless, faithful, the faithful God, yep, and faith in, that's, that's quite, that's, yeah, I like that. That's, um, that's better than my other option, I had another second option, I gave you my bad option, and then, well, this one's not much better, but I said, our mess, God's mercy, Jesus the means, there's another one, I, anyway, point being, <laughs> I'm just trying to get you, I think this does capture a lot of what God has done to resolve our tragedy, our predicament. And so it's sort of useful just to have to notice those different sections of this verse. But what are we going to do to, What are we going to do today? Well, the three things we're going to do today. We're going to dig into this summary because there's a lot of content behind this summary. And if you're at annual conference, it's a bit of a refresher. Some of this, that section will be. But uh, we're going to dig into the summary. Secondly, we're going to then understand this summary where it comes in Paul's argument, in the flow of the letter, where, what he actually says around it, to understand it in its context. And thirdly, we're going to just a bit of a reflection on what this might mean for us, this truth from God. Okay? So, first of all, let's dig into this. I'm going to pull it apart phrase by phrase. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, last week, if you were here last week, we talked about how the Apostle... You understand the goodness of God's salvation when you understand it against the reality, the dark reality of God's judgment on human sin. The brightness and wonder of salvation becomes clear when you understand the reality and judgment of God on human sin. And what we particularly looked at last week was, I tried to explain how in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul likes to put his summaries or his conclusions at the beginning. And chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, really he puts it up the front, his conclusion, and then, which is about the goodness of God's gospel. And then he goes into a long section where he steps out and paints the broader reality of God's judgment. From chapter 1, verse 18, all the way through to chapter 3, verse 20. And that's what we looked at last. We looked at that outer square of God's judgment. And then in the flow of his letter, he then comes back to talk about, then in much more detail, the, the glorious, wondrous beauty of God's gospel, what God has done for human beings in his grace and mercy. And that really starts from chapter 3, verse 20, and goes all the way through to chapter 11. Like it's, it's, he really focuses in on, as you'd hope, focuses in on the beauty and wonder of salvation that God affects for us through Jesus. So we're jumping in at chapter 3, verse 21, and he does just here recognise in verse 23 that it just pays reference to that outer, uh, the outer square of God's judgment that he spent a long, lot of time just going through. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is, we've rejected the one true living God. We, we reject his word to us. We reject his way of living in his world which in effect means that we, we refuse to worship him as the one true living God. Consequently, we fall under his judgment. And because we fall under his judgment, we fail to attain what he really wants for us. What he really wants for us is that you would enjoy and share in his glory. He wants you to share in his glory. And so because we all sin and come under his judgment, we fall short of the glory of God. Now, that is not what God would want for you, for me, for the 70,000 students at Sydney University. He doesn't want us to fall short of his glory. He wants us to enjoy his glory forever. That's, his, that's why he's made us. So what's he going to do about this human predicament, the universal human predicament? Well, the answer is here, the answer is, we are justified by his grace as a gift. Justified is not a word that we use a lot uh, and it's a bit complicated for English speakers because when we read our English Bible, sometimes we come across the word justify and sometimes we come across the word righteous. And as an English speaker, you would think they refer to two different things. They're two very different words. Turns out in the original language in which Paul wrote Romans, which was Greek, it's the same root word behind both those words. So whenever you see justify, 
You could think righteousify. Not a word we use terribly often. I'm not sure it actually exists, but it, it captures the idea of what Paul's talking about. Or when you see the word righteous, you could use the word just. Or when you see justification, you could use righteousification. Justify and righteous, same word group. Does that make sense? So when you're, do, when you're reading it yourself in English, you need to notice that because sometimes you might not realise that the ideas are connected, but they are. What does it mean, though? The word to justify or to righteousify or to declare, it's a legal word. It comes from a courtroom. If someone is justified, that means the judge has looked at you and said, you're okay. You're not guilty. You're not condemned. You are justified as you stand before me. You're, you, I declare you to be in the right to be righteous. So what is this verse saying? That we, all human beings, have the opportunity of being justified by his grace as a gift. Now, if you do have to go to court and the judge looks at you and says, not guilty, if the judge justifies you, then at that point, you are, before the law, before, the, before our country, not guilty. That judge's announcement has an effect. It declares something and that thing is what now is. Now, you might say, but in a human court, sometimes judges can make mistakes and so maybe objectively I am actually guilty. What I'm saying is, before the laws of the land, the judge's announcement has an effect. It's like saying if you go to a, 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 a wedding and then the, the pastor or the celebrant says, I now declare you to be husband and wife, that declaration is a declaration that has effect. You are now husband and wife, as it's declared. Or when the one true living God says, let there be light, and when he declares it, it happens. Does that make sense? So when the judge justifies you, you are okay. So when God looks at you and says, all have sinned and are falling short of the glory of God, but then he justifies you and says, but you are okay with me. You are right with me. You go, but I don't feel okay with you. I feel like I'm still a mess. I feel like I still stuff up all the time. I still, I can't. The judge has said you're right. You are right. Because the judge has said so. He declares you to be so. And when he declares it, it is so. And what's more, he justifies you by his grace. Grace just means undeserved kindness or undeserved favour. He justifies us as an undeserved act of his own kindness. We don't deserve to be declared righteous. We don't deserve to be justified. But he does it anyway as an undeserved gift, freely given, no payment, undeserved. That does introduce surely a bit of a problem though when you stop and think about that. I mean, it's wonderful, that's great. I got something I didn't deserve. It's always good to get something good that I don't deserve. But hang on, if we've all sinned and fall, therefore fall short of the glory of God and now God says, but you're okay, doesn't that introduce a bit of a problem for who God is? Like, is God in himself actually just? If he's declaring someone who is guilty to be not guilty that doesn't seem right and in fact in chapter 4 verse 5 we're told god is the one who justifies the ungodly isn't that a problem i mean i don't want to live in a universe where the one true living god the only god who really is i don't want to live in a universe where that god is not just that would be a bad place to live. But if God's going around justifying the ungodly, doesn't that mean, isn't there a problem here? You understand? So what's the solution here? What's the solution? Well, the solution is through Jesus, the means. Jesus at the centre. We're justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus... Redemption just means uh, to rescue someone or something. You, re you redeem something, you rescue it by payment 
of some sort of price. God rescues us by a payment of a price, the price caught up in Jesus Christ. What is that price? The next phrase. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Now, maybe if you were at EU's annual conference, we talked a bit about propitiation. You might remember what that word means. It means to turn away someone's anger by offering of a gift. And the example I used at annual conference was you turn away your mum's anger when you forget to pick up her dry cleaning by buying her some flowers. You try to propitiate her, turn away her just anger by offering of a gift. What's different here is that God propitiates himself turns away his own anger at sin by putting forward Jesus as the sacrifice. We read here, put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Jesus' death, referring to Jesus' death on the cross, is the sacrifice that turns away God's wrath on human sin. And the background there, as we talked about at the EU's annual conference, is Leviticus chapter 16 and the Day of Atonement, where uh, God's people in the Old Covenant were were helped to understand that God turns away his wrath at human wickedness by offering of a sacrifice, Jesus ultimately being that sacrifice. So this is how God reconciles him justifying the ungodly because our sin is put on Jesus' shoulders as our representative and he bears the penalty. So sin does get punished. Justice is done, which enables then God to look at you and to me and to justify the ungodly, declare us to be in the right, because the penalty has been paid. How is all of that received by us? Who receives this justification? Paul's very clear. It's received by faith, by those who have an active trust in the one true living God. Someone came up to me yesterday and asked, why have I put active trust there? Why didn't I just say, because belief and faith Again, in the Greek, same word, whenever you're reading believing or faith, same word in the original. Why have I added active into it? It's because we know from the scriptures that you know, the demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You can cognitively assent to many truths. It doesn't mean that they shape your life. It doesn't mean that you've submitted to those truths. The thing about believing in who Jesus is, means at one level it's simple, it's assenting to who he is, that he is the promised one of God, risen from the dead, died for our sins. But you do have to submit yourself to that truth. You have to align your life and your, with that truth. So faith is, a, faith is a simple thing, but it's a massive thing. It affects all of your life. And God declares people to be right with him who've submitted to the truth that Jesus is Lord and say, yes, I believe. I'm one of the people who have faith in Jesus. I entrust myself to this Jesus as my Lord and Saviour. God says, well, that does not earn you justification, but I will declare you to be right as a gift of my grace. So that's unpacking this sort of central theme, this central part of the, the Bible story. What consequences might we draw from this? A few, three consequences. First thing to say, as we sort of now step out of that little passage, that sentence, and look at the flow in Paul's argument. Three things we notice. The first thing we notice is this. Justificate, God really is righteous. God really is righteous and just. So I've got there over on the right-hand side, you can see how there's the little section that we looked at from Romans chapter 3, verse 23, through to the first part of verse 25. If you flow straight on to what he says next, this becomes clear. He says, this, namely Jesus being put forward as a propitiation for our sins, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Notice there at least three times Paul is explaining how this putting forward Jesus as a sacrifice shows that God himself really is righteous in himself. He's just in himself. He cares about justice. Sin gets what it really deserves. He's not being unjust in declaring you to be righteous. 
So it's a, just, it's, it's a defense here of, of God's righteousness, his justice. But notice also, he's not just just, the very last thing I've highlighted there, God is also then the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That is, the, he also declares you or me, if you've got faith in Jesus, to be just, to be righteous. He himself is righteous and he declares you to be righteous if you have faith in Jesus. Notice righteousness is doing, it's about God, but it's also about what he confers. That's important to note because this section of Paul's letter is often a bit confusing for people. So if we now look at what comes just before our key verses from Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, it starts to make a bit more sense. He says, but now, having talked about the judgment of God, he's now making a big shift back to the inner circle, of, uh, inner square of God's salvation. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ for all who believe. And people often say, oh, what's this righteousness of God that he's talking about here? He actually introduced it way back in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, which was sort of his summary for the whole section. What is this righteousness of God? My argument is, if you just read on through the passage, it becomes clear by the time you get to the bottom, God's righteousness has two aspects. It's his own personal righteousness, that the one true living God is really righteous, but also he's the one who declares others to be righteous the two aspects of God's righteousness. What does this mean? First of all, God is righteous because he condemns sin. Sin will get what it deserves. It gets it in the, in the Lord Jesus and it will get it on the final day of his judgment. But also, remember I said before, we've all sinned and therefore fall short of the glory of God. This is God's intent was all of his creatures might get to share in the glory of God. One way that God is righteous is that he, does, he refuses to let go of his good intentions for humanity. If God created human beings with a particular goal in mind and that goal got sort of a bit blocked by human sin and then God just went, eh, I guess I could just fail this subject anyway, I'll still get my degree. Like, you know, if he'd sort of made some sort of call, but, ah, I can't be bothered to see it through, he would not be righteous. One aspect of God's righteousness is that he achieves his good intentions for his creatures. He wants us to be, he wants every human being he's made to be able to share in his glory. And one of the ways that he shows he is righteous is by working out a way to achieve that. And he does that through the message about Jesus. So people can turn and believe that message and be saved. And in that way, the gospel shows his righteousness. Because he's, he's made a way for people to achieve the good end for which he's created us, to share in his glory. So he's righteous in condemning sin, but he's also righteous in opening a way so that we might share in his glory and fulfill his good intentions for creation. Okay, so that's the first thing we walk away with. God really is righteous both in judgment but also in salvation. Secondly, justification from God is available to all. If you were here last week, I talked a little bit about how the context in Rome was that you had Christians who'd come from a Jewish background and Christians who'd come from a Gentile background and it was easy to have tension between those two groups. So one of the things that Paul wants to keep emphasising is that God shows no partiality. God does not have a preference for Jew over Gentile or Gentile over Jew. It's the same for all. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But all are now justified freely by his grace through faith in Christ because Jesus is our sacrifice. And you can see this time and time again in what flows from the rest of this section. So, for example, in Romans chapter 3, verse 28 to 30, he says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And then he has some rhetorical questions. Or is God the God of Jews only? Answer, no. Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one, and here's the key bit, who will justify the circumcised, that is the Jews, by faith, and the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, through faith. There are not two ways of salvation. 
Now, you might not be surprised by that, but there are many people, many Christians, who still think that somehow Jews who've rejected Jesus are still somehow going to be saved. This verse seems to pretty clearly say, no, there's only one way that salvation comes to human beings. Irrespective of whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, it's by faith in the Lord Jesus. He will justify the circumcised and the uncircumcised both through faith in Jesus. Justification from God is therefore available to all and on the same basis. What does that mean? Every single person out there, all the people in our families, all the people in our networks, all the people that we're friends with, there is only one way that they can be justified, righteous, declared right by God. God's done all the work in, in the sacrifice of Jesus. There's no more that they have to do or pay. Or He offers it justification as a, as a gift, an undeserved gift of his kindness. They just need to believe. They just need active trust. They just need to submit to the Lord Jesus. And God will say, you don't deserve this, but justified. You don't deserve this, but righteous. You don't deserve it, but blameless. With me for eternity, sharing my glory. You don't deserve it, but that's all you've got to do to receive his gift. That's what we want to proclaim to our campus. That's what they need to know. They need to know about the coming judgment of God, but they need to know that actually they don't have to endure the coming judgment of God because he's done everything necessary. They just need to submit to the fact that Jesus is Lord and receive his gift. Justification from God is available to all. Uh, Paul then goes on, just to sort of uh, track through Paul's argument, Paul goes on then into chapter 4 to give Abraham as a key example of this truth. Now, this is a very, uh, this is like when you're reading something and you go, oh, that was a clever move. Oh, not, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought of that, right? This is where you go, whoa, Abraham is it? Why is that? Well, because who was the father of the Jewish nation? Abraham. If you were, if you were a part of the Jewish nation, then by birth, then that meant that you were literally a biological descendant of Abraham. That's who the Jews were. They were defined by their biology. And he uses Abraham as an example that everyone can be justified by faith. How does that work? Well, you can see what he says. He says, The purpose was to make Abraham the father of all who believe... Sorry, I'll read that again. The purpose was to make Abraham the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So what he does is he goes back to the stories about Abraham in, in the book of Genesis. And if you know something about it, Genesis chapter 12, the one true living God makes promises to Abraham, you're going to become a great nation, I'll take you to a land, you'll be my people. Fast forward to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15 God says, reiterates sort of that promise to Abraham. And Abraham says, well, um, that I'm going to be the father of a great nation, that's a bit tricky because I'm an old dude and I've got no kids. So how am I going to be the father? And Sarah, who I love, is also super old. Like, so how are we going to have kids? How's this going to happen? God says, go outside, Abraham. Abraham goes outside, night time. He says, look up at the stars. Abraham, very dutiful. He looks up, stars, yes, many stars. He says, as many stars as you can see, that's how many descendants you're going to have. I mean, God doesn't answer Abraham's question. He just reiterates a promise. You're going to have that many descendants, mate. Like that. And what do we read next in Genesis chapter 15? The writer says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God's promise. Now, fast forward, this is Paul's clever move. Pass, fast forward two more chapters in Genesis, Genesis chapter 17, and the one true living God gives Abraham a sign of this covenant that's been established between them. And that sign is that Abraham and all his descendants have to be circumcised, all his male descendants have to be circumcised. And Paul's observation is this, when was Abraham declared to be righteous? When he got circumcised 
which was sort of a key part of the later law that was to come, or was it before he was circumcised? Well, Genesis 15 comes before Genesis 17. It was before he was circumcised. He says, so Abraham, whilst yes, he's the father of everybody who received the law, he's the father of all the Jews, true, but also, he says, he's the, sort of the father also of everyone who doesn't receive the law but believes God and is credited as righteousness. He's the father of us all, everyone who has faith, whether from a Jewish background or not. So Abraham is a key example of this truth for him. Third and final consequence or sort of observation. Justification is by grace through faith. And that's the emphasis in chapter 4 with Abraham, that Abraham believed God. And what is this faith? Well, in chapter 4, faith is putting your hope in God's promises despite your present circumstances. What I mean is this. Sometimes your situation says to you, trusting God is not, I mean, it seems unlikely that he's going to come through for you at this point. That was Abraham's situation. He was a hundred, a hundred years old. Sarah was a sprightly 90. And yet God makes this promise that you're going to have kids. A great... But Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as right. He believed despite what his circumstances or in the middle of sort of contrary sort of circumstances. That's what faith looks like. Faith is putting your hope in God's promises despite the present circumstances that you might be in. And so we get this section in, I'll just read it from Romans chapter 4, verse 17. Abraham is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. When we have that same faith, the same faith that Abraham showed, that is the faith that God says, you're righteous, you're justified. That's the faith that he calls us to have. Faith despite our circumstances. So, what does this all mean for us? When you get through into chapter 5, which is sort of where we're wrapping up today, when you get through into chapter 5, Paul talks about some of the implications for us of having been justified through faith. The first thing he says is, as a result of being justified, being declared to be righteous, you have peace with God and the sure hope of sharing God's glory, the thing that previously you were excluded from. You can see there at the beginning of chapter 5, therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. That's what we are offering to our campus over the next couple of weeks. You can have peace with the one true living God, though currently all have sinned. But what's more, you have a future. You have a sure hope of a future sharing God's eternal glory. Lots of people on our campus are chasing some sort of glory. They're chasing a glorious relationship. They're chasing relationships, you know, fulfillment, some sort of glorious relationship. They're, they're, they're chasing some sort of glorious success whether academically, professionally. The Olympics is full of people chasing little bits of gold glory, right, to hang around the necks. Like, we ch human beings, we chase after glory, and yet the one true living God says, I know because I've created you for glory. But the glory I've created for you is my eternal glory. And you can have it if you turn to Jesus. What we're offering our campus is that for which they don't even realise re they really are seeking, what will actually satisfy them. And Paul draws three things out of that. When you have that, when you have peace with God and the sure hope of eternal glory, that transforms your experience of the present. It means that you can rejoice in your present suffering because you have peace with God and you know your eternal hope. It transforms your craving for love because you know God's love for you seen in the Lord Jesus. 
and it transforms your worries, your anxieties about the future because you have this sure hope. And I tell you what, just as I chat to students on our campus, there is a lot of craving after love. There is a lot of anxiety about the future. There is a lot of suffering and mess and, that people have to deal with. The hope that people are longing for is found in the gospel of Jesus. So I hope that encourages, some of these truths encourage you and I hope that you filled with boldness from his spirit and love for those around you that you might share some of these truths with those in your life over the next couple of weeks. And we pray God might bring them to the joy that we share. Amen. Thanks for listening to today's talk. The Evangelical Union, or EU, is a student club on campus at Sydney University that seeks to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. To join us or to find out more, please visit sydneyunieu.org.